right now these um, books that have been turned into movies, does that influence how you write now? Do you see it more in the movie sense? You know, I haven't written a ton since the movies became a big deal and since I became more involved with them. Um, so I don't know if it will. I mean, I think right now working on the sequels to the post, there are some some interesting pressures. You know, having worked with Sersha, it's like, oh, you know, you want her in every scene. Right? And now Wanda is not her, and so it's it's tricky. Um, I do sometimes think about some of the stories that I've got in the back of my computer that are unfilmable, and that is a, a good thing in my mind. Like, that's kind of cool. Like, I want to write something you couldn't make into a movie. <laughs> You know, there, it, it seems like that would be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. right. speaking, uh, speaking of unfilmable, was there ever a discussion of, of showing any of Wander's other worlds? Yeah, actually, it was in the script. We really wanted to do it. You know, Andrew was so amazingly visual. Um, I would have loved to have seen what he would do with that. But we were working on a non-studio budget, mm -hmm. and that was one of the first things to go when we were like, okay, we have to cut things. We only ended up with one helicopter. I mean, there were a lot of. We didn't actually. The final scene in the movie was actually uh, additional footage we did six or seven months later, because um, the movie turned out so well. We were able to. Somebody kicked in a little bit more, and so we were able to do that last scene. But I mean, everything was shoestring. It, it's it's a was a very large budget for an independent movie, but a very small budget for kind of the caliber of movie we were doing. It's tricky. We were curious about um, what the process was for casting Emily. Emily Browning, the for pet. Well, okay. for Wanda. All right. Um, is that out now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sersha is talking about that. Sersha. 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 I think it's just like day players, like really, the, you know, local actresses. And um, I said, you know, <laughs> she's taking over the narrator's role. You might want to think about what that would mean if we went ahead. Um, and luckily, at the time, Max was dating Emily, and so we had an in to like, and she was she was in to do it. I mean, it's a lot to ask a, an actress of her caliber to come in and you know do a day a day's work. Um, you know, it's kind of a cameo sort of thing. But she was really cool about it, and she's got that amazing face. Um, so that was, mm -hmm. it was really cool to have someone who, who's so striking and so talented come in for a, a day. That was very nice. <laughs> what was, okay. Whose idea was it to go with the white and the silver for the host? Oh, that was Andrew. Yeah. Andrew, you know, when I visualized this world, um, it looked out like ours, more like ours than the movie does. You know, I just kind of figured they, they're coming in and, and taking over us, but they're not going to change that much. And, um, and they didn't. He still had that mindset that he thought they would make it a little prettier and shinier than we do. And he thought because they are silver themselves, they'd have an affinity for that color. And that sort of became, from the very beginning, a touchstone for him of, of things that are more soul-oriented. There was this hint of silver in it. Uh, he's, he's really amazingly visual. It's just it's so amazing. You guys have seen it, so you know how the look of it is. You know, He just really knows how to make every pebble in the scene is there for a reason and has a certain look to it. It's really well, and it makes a good contrast between the humans and yes. the caves and the dirt to the streamlined yes. cleanliness. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Emily Browning, we all know that you had thought about her for Bella, so what was it like actually mm -hmm. having her in one of your characters, as one of her characters? It was really cool, and I never, you know, I never said anything to her. I was a little, I felt a little weird because, like, does she know that people were... Photoshopping her into those things. <laughs> um, but I know, but I, she has been someone I've been a fan of for a long time. So it's always exciting to work with people that you think are awesome. So that was cool. What took this film so long to get made? Because it's been like over three years now since it was first announced, mm -hmm. and you even had a different director at one point. Mm -hmm. So why so long? Well, I'm. It took a long time to publish it too. This book has just kind of been, for me, sort of a, a more private world for a while. And so it was when they first wanted to make it, it was kind of this this dream thing, right? Let's get together and make a movie. But we didn't have a lot of concrete things to help move us forward. Um, and Andrew was one of those very concrete things, you know, with all of his talent and everything that he's done. Um, but his baby got greenlit um, right around the time, and so. 
in time. And so then he, you know, obviously that was something that was really important to him. And, and I wanted, I, I thought it'd be, I didn't want to change in the middle. Um, it was kind of worried me a bit. Uh, but, you know, Susanna's great. And now I kind of have this real desire to work with her at some future point because I enjoyed her so much. And so hopefully we can get together and work on a project at some point. But then things, you know, as we were kind of cobbling together financing and, and not going to the studio where it takes a lot longer. Uh, and as we were doing that, all of a sudden, in time was over. And so we were kind of back to, oh, we can do this the way we sort of originally imagined it. And that was, that was exciting. But, you know, anytime we're putting a movie project together, there are ups and downs, there are people who come in, and there are people who fall out, and it's like, ah, a lot of panic. <laughs> all the time yeah, with an independent movie. <laughs> How did your role as producer differ from the Twilight series? Did you feel um, more pressure? Did you feel more free being a new series and that people might not be familiar with, with the new movie? Uh, well, I was a lot more involved with this one from the beginning. And uh, I think my role on this is what people imagine my role has been all along as a producer because you think, oh, she's producing and she wrote the book, so she's probably involved in every decision. And on the Twilight movies, that wasn't always the case. Um, with the, our original cast, I just really heard about them after the fact. Um, and so I was more involved with the casting later on, but just for side characters that had little parts, and so it didn't affect the feel of it as much. Um, with the host, I was involved with the, the, every casting choice that we made. I was going over the script with Andrew from, you know, with each version of it. Um, I really was involved in everything on this one, so it feels more like it's mine in some ways. I mean, I, that's the wrong word to use, because when you have a filmmaker like Andrew Nichol doing it, it's very much his work, and I wouldn't want to take credit for that. But it does feel closer to me, um, because I got to be so involved with it, um, which is really nice. I, I don't really feel the pressure that way with, you know, oh, Twilight was so huge, so now does the host need to be huge? To me, it just needed to be good, and uh, I was so pleased with it. I, you know, I'm really am proud of it, and so for me, that's enough. I know for the financiers, they'd probably like for it to be huge, but for me, I was just really happy to have it be a really quality thing I could be proud of. Did you ever have a moment with, um, you know, the cast of the host saying, you know, this could get a little crazy from you coming into what Twilight, you know, the fandom that had been around that and all the fan camps and everything. Did you ever have that moment with um, the new cast that you've worked with saying, you know, Everyone asks them that, and um, I think for them it's kind of a jinxy thing, right? To say, "Oh, yeah, I'm totally prepared," um, <laughs> you know. And, and they don't, and they, and you, they can't think that way. I mean, when you're an actor, you have all, you have a role that you see an amazing movie made, and you're like, "Oh my gosh, this is this," is, and then no one sees the movie, and and here's this amazing performance. I think they, that as an actor, you kind of come to terms with what will be will be because you have to. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're what if they would. I don't think you can prepare for something. I don't know that it would ever be the same thing. I don't know if you would, you can't have the same thing twice, so I don't imagine it would be. Um, but and they don't need it. These kids, they're going places anyway. I mean, you, if you've seen the movie, you've seen how good they are. They're they're all of them ready to do really well, and uh, it's not going to depend on this movie for sure. Uh, so uh, the tagline of the movie is choose to fight, choose to love, choose to believe. What's something that you believe in and fight for? I didn't come up with that tagline, so. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, I guess this sounds, you know, boring, but I mean, honestly, it's my kids, my family, that's, that's really the only thing I fight for, I guess. <laughs> it's interesting that you would say that, because your last two books, Breaking Dawn and Post, both had children in pretty difficult, intense situations. It Was that on purpose, because family so important, or is that just how the story played out? I mean, I don't have to do anything on purpose, but I don't think it's an accident that my stories go toward that direction, because uh, the relationship I have with my children, the amount of time I spend worrying about them, the amount of my mind that they control at any given point, you know, that so much of me belongs to them. Um, it's, I mean, I think my stories will always have some element that will reflect that to the, the way I feel about them, because they're this... I mean, my family is the strongest relationship and the most life-changing one in my life, or, you know, take me a different person, and so that's going to come out in the stories subconsciously all the time. <laughs> <laughs> kind of off subject, but what's going on in the dressing room? Um, we're at a very early stage with the development. We're working on, on finding a writer for the script, but Down a Dark Hall is sort of the first on the, mm -hmm. on the conveyor belt. I don't know how to say that right. And, uh, and so that one, when we, get, when we get that to a place, then we'll kind of move on to the 
Yes. There were a couple different untimely outcomes for some of the characters in the film, rather than in the book. Will that influence um, you writing their characters? Um, untimely the outcomes, what do you mean? Like Aaron and Grant dying, or, um, or the father killing no. himself? No, no. I mean, the, the father killing himself happens in the novel. Oh. Um, that's that's same, the same, although it's a little visually different out in the bayou. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, Aaron and Brant would still. I'm not gonna off them because they, you know, they'll still be part of the story. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are some things that'll affect the fact that Sunny doesn't appear in the story. Yeah, it's I going to have to be <laughs> because she's a, a larger character. So that's somebody that is going to have to. Uh, we're gonna have to do something there. I mean, we're lucky we got Burns in because that was the very end, you know, mm -hmm. and he's also someone that I, I. I think when they originally were doing it, they were looking at. Um, hiring someone who was very physically different, just a day player in Louisiana, and I was like, oh, you might not want to tell yourself that I'm just saying. Sometimes it's, it's hard to be like, oh, just trust me on this one, let's, let's go a little younger, let's not have him be 60. Like, oh. <laughs> um, so the prank thing is really big, and Jake asked us to prank you, but I can't do it. Of course he did, because he's on the losing end right now, now I'm living in fear. We want to ask your advice about a prank that we plan on doing to him. Okay, I'm not. So Max gave us this idea that that's why this is here, to have him sign it, and as he turns around, I act like I'm sneezing and spray a bottle of Evian mist on it. Poor, poor Jake and his German <laughs> <laughs> He might not, he might not laugh at that one. I, 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 think, I think the prank war needs to end. I mean, we've spent a lot of time together in the last month. Um, we, we've heard the same answers from each other mm -hmm. for a month. We're all really bored with each other. And I mean, actually, I love the kids. They're really fun. But we are tired a lot and kind of yeah. looking for ways to have fun. And the ping pong ball thing. That's hilarious. That was hilarious. It was, it was hilarious last night. During the signing, mm -hmm. it wasn't as hilarious. It's like, what am I supposed to do with all these ping pong balls? Like, you don't give me bullets and I so need to shoot them at you. <laughs> That's his mistake. Um, but so I don't know. I hope it ends because I'm next if it doesn't. <laughs> So on set, well, sorry. <laughs> okay, you started as an author, now you're doing production. Do you see yourself long term splitting writing and also being a producer? Do you really like producing? Is it? I do. You know, it's kind of, um, I don't know, have you ever read a book and like imagine how it would be to film mm -hmm. and, like the actors and sort of cast your head? I've always done that a little bit. I like movie adaptations, but I almost always prefer the book. I cannot think of the only one exception. And I, uh, I think that. That's just something that I find fun. It's like, you know, dollhouses and dressing up your Barbies or whatever. It's like playing a game. Um, it's a whole different kind of creativity. Uh, it's, a, it's a more um, collaborative space where you have people hang out with who aren't your imaginary friends, which can be nice too. Um, but the writing is a lot, uh, it's more of a pure form for a creative outlet. You don't have to compromise on anything. Actors don't tell you no. You don't have to cut scenes out for length. It's, you can do whatever you want, and that's, it's a more free situation, but you also have to have private time to do it, which is really hard to come by, even without the movies. My kids are growing up, they're more interactive, it's hard for me to uh, like really disconnect my brain from, from them as much as I could when they were little and, and didn't have as many conversations going on. Um, but so I, I do want to do both. I don't want to be as active as a producer, you know, physically there all the time. I'd rather be more involved at the beginning stages, the scripting, the casting, you know, that kind of stuff I can do from home. Um, and that's why I have a partner, because she's going to deal with business. <laughs> and I'll just sit home and say, how's it going? It's very awesome. <laughs> that's it. So I'll be home writing, and she'll be out in the dirt and the dust and staying up all night doing night shoots. It's going to be perfect. What was the exception you said there was one movie? Oh, going? oh, um, I'm in the board movies. I, I like that he really is an assassin. It kind of, I, I'd seen the movies first, and then you read the book, and like it's all cop out, and he's actually a good guy. Oh, no, I want to be a killer. <laughs> so, uh, all right, there was another thing back here. I, I was going back to the pranks, but I'll, <laughs> being on set with everybody, I, Jake was obviously the most of the prankster. We heard yeah, we about the cockroach. We didn't prank that much on set. Um, it, because we were, there's a lot to engage you, you know, and, and, and you've got really long hours and everything. There's a lot of repetition on a press tour, and then you're kind of looking for an outlet. Whereas they, on, on, on set, there's a lot to, to do mentally. Jake, particularly, I mean, all of them do, but Jake takes 
his role very seriously. He very much gets into that space where the character is, and so he's thinking like that and trying to be that person. And so it, it kept him from too much mischief because he was very busy. <laughs> and is there anything special that you took or didn't was given? I was from given. Um, I've never taken anything, and sometimes I, I wish I had. It's like oh, I would have liked that, but I but I you know I felt bad. So I was given. Two things. One, I have one of the peace sprays, which is really cool. Oh, oh, I um, I'm supposed to get a cryopod. I haven't yet. I'm looking forward to that. And then I have a rock that we didn't use. Um, you know, in the book, there's a scene where she has the scar on her face, and it's a big scar. It's like so it's going to yeah. fall over her hand, and he has to hit her with the rock. And for a multitude of reasons, we didn't do that, but we planned on it. And so I have this great, it looks so real, and it's out of foam. And it's my favorite thing, because when I first got home, I was throwing it at everybody. And, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, look at this rock. I got them sent. Oh, I got them. <laughs> and it's just a small thing. That it and so I had a lot of fun with that, but it doesn't actually appear in the movie. Yeah. I took teacups from Austin then. <laughs> one of them from a scene that was cut, and then one that they use in the... So I know I, you said that um, um, the Sony Classics purchased it at, um, so at uh, Sundance, and it's supposed to come out in the summer. I'm excited for it to come out. It's really funny. I love the ball. Can't wait to see the movie. Thank you. <laughs> so I know that you said that Andrew Nichol is brilliant, um, and you were really excited to have him direct this um, for you and bring the adaptation to life. But I remember you also said that he had some really, really good ideas that you were kind of kicking yourself that you didn't think of one of them being the peace spray and taking mm -hmm. the violence and the guns away because they were, you know, not violent and they were more pure. Are there any other I mean, that um, was, ideas that he came up with that... That was the main thing. Um, a couple of ideas uh, that just hadn't occurred to me. Um, you know, we were filming in Louisiana because that's where you film now. And uh, when we were doing the Twilight movies there, the whole time we were trying to hide the fact that we were in Louisiana. So we were, you know, everything was on sound stages, and when we were outside, we like found the one stand of trees in the entire place, and then brought in extra trunks to make it look like a bigger forest, and, and we were always trying to disguise where we were. And Andrew said, you know, what if we embrace it? We have Melanie B. from Louisiana, and then we can shoot in the swamp and with the houses on the pillars, and we can, and we can be out on a beautiful plantation with the trees full of full of moss and everything. I thought that was a really good, because it doesn't matter, and the story, she can be from anywhere, it doesn't affect the story if she's not from, you know, San Diego, and it doesn't, it doesn't change anything, and so then we got to really celebrate the beauties of where we were, um, because he's always good at finding the best look for anything, and I loved it, we, the whole time we were on Twilight, we never got to go and film in the swamp, which was really cool, <laughs> it was fun to, to get to see all of the really cool parts of Louisiana. Yeah. I had read the book on the plane here, and then watched the movie last night, and I was noticing, like, how insanely visual he really is like to keep from the book did you were you involved in that a lot like keeping it like do you know what I mean it really feels like you took exactly your complete visuals from the book and put them into the film well, I think he heightened the visuals a lot um, little things that I wish I mean if we put all the footage we had in it would be four hours long mm. um, but I yeah. wish <laughs> yeah. but it isn't like, it's not like big you know pivotal scenes or, or even dialogue it's just I wish you could see more of the souls walking around because they're their uh, wardrobe and just the way they hold themselves and, and we shot some pieces that we, that we didn't fit everything in and, but it just looks so cool yeah. and I didn't picture them dressing like just that little bit more with a little bit more polish than we do. I was noticing so much about their outfits and I usually don't do that when I watch films and I was like oh look at their shoes like look at their <laughs> shirts like I'm like I was so conscious of it that entire time. He, he, he's like if he was filming our little round table right now, he would come over and he would mess with your hand like two, and then and then he'd be like, and he'd come back and he'd go one millimeter more, and then he'd come back and he one millimeter more. Mm -hmm. He cares about every hair mm -hmm. that's in the scene. It's it's an amazing thing. It can make for a long filming day. Yeah. <laughs> at the end, it's totally worth it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you said you had you would probably have like four hours of footage. So what was going into the decision to keep it just at two hours instead of maybe? Pushing it to two and a half. I mean, it's a big time commitment when you hear the movie is two and a half hours, and you know, every some things that you love can start to feel bloated. I think in the in the time, you know, because you're looking at all these nuances, and someone who comes to see the movie wants the story. I mean, I don't know. Some people, I would be happy to sit through two and a half hours of a movie that yeah. I loved. And then I have said in movies that I didn't love that you were two and a half hour long, and it felt very long. Um, it wasn't that big of a sacrifice. I felt like it was a lot harder on Austin actually because we have. A three and a half hour comedy, 
and we had to cut whole scenes, and nobody wants a comedy over 90 minutes, but we were cutting ridiculously funny scenes because we had to keep the story in. That's where the DVD extras yeah. are going to be amazing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just one uh, last question, I guess. Um, from someone who hasn't read the book and saw it last night, that's actually Jordan, he, um, <laughs> he wanted to know how did the souls initially come to Earth? How did they insert themselves into the first human? Which is well, something I never thought about. I mean, I think it's a little bit in there. I, I think actually the the uh, opening, I get confused because I've had the opening for the second book written for a really long time. That's something I did in the early stages because I wasn't sure where I was going to put it that goes into more detail with that. Um, but they came with their spider bodies uh, because those are really uh, useful. You know, they have a lot. They're they're strong and they can handle a lot. And so they just had to get to a few people because once you have one and a cryo tank, a big one of the big cryo tanks where they keep the babies, where there's like you know a million of them, it doesn't take long. So they like it, it talks about in the beginning of the next one how they worked in. Like you find the preschool teacher or probably not preschool, you'd want like the, the high school teacher of the kid who is the Secret Service agent. And through that, you work into the president like in four easy steps. And then once you have the president and his people under, and you start controlling the information, and you're doing this in every country. And then, you know, I would invite Lori over for an afternoon lunch, and she would say, oh, of course, I haven't seen Stephanie in a while, and then she would leave a different person, because, you know, it would just be that smooth. And your husband and your kids and everybody that you know and all of your friends would then slowly, it wouldn't take that long, because it just works out exponentially. Um, and it's very quiet, and no one knows what's going on, so you don't lose your memories, there's nothing to give you away. In the movie, the eyes are a little bit more obvious, right? And yeah. So it, it would be easier, but in the books, you have to have a direct light, even then it's kind of just a reflection that's a little off, but it's not, it's not so obvious to be like, there's something different about you. Mm. It would just be, oh, hey, my neighbors are a lot nicer lately. They never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's driving the speed limit. <laughs>